come in and sit down, door hoverers. What we could do while we're waiting is click our fingers to unify the field. Instant intimacy. Phones off. Well, thank you very much for coming and joining in Transforming Shadows workshop. And um, I'm sorry that we didn't put, well, I'm not really sorry. I'm partly sorry that we didn't put a description in because it's different every time. But um, <coughs> it's always interesting to do this stuff at a festival because uh, we have this culture of waiting for summer to come around and come to the festivals and be a bit more of ourselves and wear silly hats and brighter colours and uh, it's always a bit curious why we save our bright colours for the festivals and our silly hats and our costumes and our butterfly face paints why is it that we wait until the summer comes around to be a bit more of ourselves and uh, allow a bit more of our uniqueness to be seen? The reason that I teach these workshops is because it puzzles me how much of the year we spend not being ourselves, how much of the year we spend being in hiding, or having this complicit agreement that we'll all say we're fine when someone asks and skip along the surface a lot of the time, particularly in the workplace. How are you fine? Oh, how are you fine? How are the kids fine? See you Sunday fine. And we skip along in this auto-reaction, auto-reply mode and so rarely feel safe enough to say what really is going on. I'm not saying when anybody asks who you, how you're doing, you have to list every single problem that's going on with your plumbing. Oh, I'm just gonna have to put up with that thing. <laughs> Would you mind coming that side of the line? Indulge me. I'll have a diva attack and storm out. So there's something a little bit strange going on inside our families and in the workplace where we are not really saying what's going on when people ask. And we've got this in many, many jobs. Actually, not very many of you look like you have jobs. <laughs> but in many of the places where I go, I mean, who would want a job? I don't quite get that. For me, it's like there's, there's the, kind, the kind of people in the world who have such huge peaks and troughs that the, the, the troughs are so deep that they just can't get out of bed and they're sort of drooling and moaning and, and the peaks are so high that it's just incredibly ecstatic and they're running out and directing the traffic. And, and those people sadly have to be like in a hospital or be cared for around the clock because they can't look after themselves. And then on this side, you've got the more even keel people, not this side, <laughs> this metaphorical side, you lot, um, the people who are sort of more even keel and, and those people are <laughs> have a job and um, do the same thing every day and maybe it doesn't even mean much to them and they can cope with that. So between these huge peaks and troughs people who can't look after themselves and these even keel people who seem to be okay with the job, 
there's us lot in the middle who are sort of artisty, creative types who are sort of quite big feet to drop, barely managing our mental illness. But not so much that we need to be in a hospital, but we couldn't possibly have a job every day doing the same thing. And we're in this funny predicament where we come out at festivals and wear silly hats. The thing is that we have the edge that we have this huge treasure trove of resources which is based in all the things we don't say. All the things that we don't say, all the things that we don't show, all the ways that we have presented this normal, appropriate, slightly groomed version of ourselves. That appropri appropriate version of ourselves has no ability to make a masterpiece. I don't just mean a masterpiece like making a great film or a great album or a great piece of art. I mean, I want every aspect of my life to be a masterpiece. I want my sex life to be a masterpiece, I want my parenting, I want all my relationships, I want how I live every day to be visceral and amazing because we've basically got 30 more, 40 more summers left before we're all pissing in our pants and it goes quick. And then it's over. It's precious. So I'm in the business of making masterpieces, not just of art and film and, and stuff like that, but of every day. Masterpieces of relationship, masterpieces of intimacy. So I find ourselves in this predicament where, because of the way we've been brought up, and I'll try and say this quick because I know many of you have come to my stuff before, so this will try and be the short version. We don't have two whole days to frolic. When we were all brought up, pretty much everybody in this room, when you were brought up as a baby, you came into this kind of fleshy spacesuit thing that we're all sitting inside, and it's this amazing machine we're all sitting inside, which is built to have experiences. It's an experience engine. It has, has nerves on it so you can touch, you can taste stuff, you can hear stuff, you can hear, see stuff. What else can you do? You can smell stuff. You've also got this full-on tumultuous emotional body going on, which is doing its own thing, constantly getting triggered, all these emotions popping up everywhere. We've got this incredible 3D emotional experience engine that we're sitting inside. But when we first get born, we're just a floppy, pointless baby, basically. Babies are, little, you know, not like a horse that gets born and can walk around and start eating grass immediately. We're like this floppy thing. Taught how to pick stuff up and how to walk and how to communicate and how to be with each other. And our parents and carers, this is where the trouble starts. Our parents and our carers, the way that we're taught how to exist and how to use this machine, this to exist in a body, they teach us how to do it. And when we get it right, you get tons of approval and praise. And you get it right, they go, oh, wonderful, it's a cute little kisses and prizes and stuff when you get it right, lots of approval. And when you don't get it right, you get much less. And if you were born before 1971, you might get a whack. So this is the way that we're taught. And it's started a problem for us right at the beginning. That we get lots and lots of approval when we get it right. And we get approval withheld, sometimes love withheld, when we get it wrong in all areas. And the crack dealers among you will know that when you give something great and then you withhold it, and then you give something great and then you withhold it, that creates, in the human, an addiction. We've all been turned into approval addicts by our upbringing. We've been given approval, then had it taken away. Given approval, then had it taken away. And we're so, so hooked into approval. That's why brothers and sisters, they love each other. They play with each other. The brothers and sisters, it's their favorite person, their great companion. But the moment one of them does something that is naughty, they're straight to mum and dad going, did you see what he did? Did you see what she did? They're so addicted to raising themselves and the league table of approval, they will stitch up their brother or sister at any opportunity. Because we have trained them and brainwashed them to be much more concerned with our approval than anything else. And if you want to do a depressing experiment with uh, yours or someone else's children, it's always good to experiment on children. <laughs> If you want to do an experiment on your kids, ask them, why do I love you? They will probably reply, something to do with being good or obedience. And then you can start crying at how you fucked them up already. <laughs>
because the way that we're bringing up our kids and the way that we were bro brought up, when you, like when you come down the stairs wearing that pretty dress, not you, sir. <laughs> you come down the stairs wearing the pretty dress, and everyone goes, oh, you learn immediately, ah, oh, approval, pretty good, not pretty, bad. The moment you are hooked into that approval addiction, society can control you. The next thing that then happens, it's not enough just to have approval withdrawn when, it doesn't, when you don't quite get it right. When you do something which your parents and carers hate or are stressed out by, and they go, stop that, that's disgusting. It's, like, oh, it's such an impact on our heart, it's such a blow, that we decide at that moment, never let anyone see me do that ever again. Suppress that forever. Be a good girl for mummy. Okay, snip, suppress. Oh, stop being so messy all the time, you messy child. Oh, okay, be tidy forever. Constantly, when we get really strong negative feedback, it's so painful and it sends us into such panic and trauma about this approval addiction. We've made loads of decisions without realizing it and started snipping and suppressing parts of ourselves and we've all done it. Every single one person in this room has snipped, suppressed, cut, and it goes on through school. Ugh, you're so uncool. Okay, never wear colors ever again, apart from at the festivals. <laughs> never dance ever again. So unconsciously, we have snipped and suppressed and cut and kind of violently edited ourselves down to these crippled brochures of ourselves that we present to the world. The brochure, the good bits, the bits that are going to get love or the bits that aren't going to get rejected. Some more than others. Some people are in total rebellion of that, but you're still, you're still caught, even if you're anti-approval. You're still caught by it. So all of us, and this is how all of the workshops begin, everybody arrives at the workshop wearing their <coughs> crippled brochure outfit. You're, you're not, you haven't brought you, the big, juicy, unapologetic, gorgeous, fabulous version of yourself. You've brought you, minus all the bits that people once told you weren't acceptable. Just believe everything I say. Right? So just <laughs> act as if it's true. It'd be a lot better for all of us. And the tragedy of that is no great masterpieces ever come out of that place. The appropriate ver I mean, who ever heard of anyone falling mad? You know, have you met Bill? Oh, he's so appropriate. <laughs> Those are not the bits that that's not what we fall in love with. The artists that you love, the movies that you love, the music that you love, the crazy people that you love, the people that really turn you on, it's those people that are fascinated with the edge of this crippled, twisted shape we've all edited ourselves down to. Every one of you is a crazy, wounded freak that turns up to work every day or with your family, pretending that we're not an obsessive nutter. <laughs> yes? Yeah, yeah. When I say anything that you agree with, you just put your hand up like that. But if I say something that you massively agree with, you throw your hands in the air and go, Amen, Hallelujah, Jesus. You, get, you bear me gospel witness when I speak the truth. It helps me out. All these crippled brochures. The exciting thing is that in the place in the basement where we kept all the other bits of ourselves, because you can't amputate any part of yourself. You can suppress it, you can keep it in the basement, but what happens with a beach ball when you push it deeper, deeper down under the swimming pool, when you let it go, it flies up. So all these parts of ourselves that we're pretending are not us, they find ways out, don't they? They find ways to leak out in sabotaging, embarrassing moments. You can't keep your dark side down. It's gonna leak out. Because this incredible body, this incredible experience engine that you've been given is the most extraordinary, genius, advanced, self-mending thing in the world. This is the most incredible self-mending thing. You scratch the surface of it, you draw blood, it mends itself, like Harry Potter. I mean, it doesn't do it like, oh, I'm ocularum. But it, over a few days, whatever, it just mends itself. Do you ever think about that? It's pretty awesome. You break a bone, it mends itself. Every one of your bodies, night and day, is scanning for viruses and bacteria and stuff that shouldn't be there. Then, it's making drugs. Making drugs? Oh yeah, really? Yes. Secreting stuff, mixing it together, administering it to you, perfect quantities, night and day, as Deepak Chopra says, in exquisite pharmacy. 
I don't know who it was that decided at some point in the late 70s or 80s that talking in silly accents was racist. It's not racist to love silly accents, and I just want to remove that ban right now. Indian accents, Yorkshire accents, Irish accents, they're brilliant to play around with, and you're allowed to do it from now on. It doesn't mean you're a racist. I mean, you are a racist, but you're not a racist because of that. I'm a racist. I'm everything. I can't help it. I'm a racist. I've noticed myself having prejudice against whenever I hear a white South African. Can't help it. I was brought up in a time where white South Africans were racists and being mean to Nelson Mandela and stuff like that. So whenever I hear a white South African, before I've come back to presence, I'm immediately like, oh, dodgy. We're all like the so we've got this huge treasure trove. The thing is that the basement where we keep all that stuff is full of juice. And we've got to find healthy ways, like the Tibetan Buddhists call it, feeding meat to the demons. We've got all these demons, we've got all these parts of ourselves that we think it's better no one sees. Our violence, our neediness, oh, thank you. our greed. Yeah. Being greedy, oh no, no, I'm not greedy. Oh no, 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 I'm not needy. Oh no, no, no. I'm not rageful. Well, yes, you are. We all are. But we've been so conditioned that there are certain parts of ourselves that are not acceptable in society. We just go around pretending that we're not. And it's fucking us up and giving us cancer. Because any part of ourselves that we don't feed meat to the demons, any part of ourselves that we don't give a bit of oxygen to somewhere, is going to start fester and growing moss and leap out at horrible moments. And that's why you suddenly find yourself screaming at the children. The calmest of us. Suddenly you get, you're tired one day, you're pushed to the point one day, you suddenly behave like your parents. You can't believe it. Because I said so. Where did that come from? Someone I once interviewed, they said, uh, your dad is always in the car, just make sure you're behind the wheel. The thing about this incredible self-mending machine that is hardwired to constantly be mending itself is that it's not only mending itself on a physical way when you scratch the skin or break the bone, it's not only mending itself there, it's also mending the fucked up way that you've edited yourself down to this small fake version of yourself. This small groomed version of you that you think might be working quite well for you in your life, your whole genius body-mind system isn't interested in that. It is constantly working night and day to create experiences which invite you to stretch yourself back to the big, unapologetic, inspired version of you. And any part of you and me that we're suppressing, that we're hiding, that we're in denial of, that we're pretending isn't there, life is going to find a way to draw it out and make us see it. Has anyone noticed that about their life? Oh, yes. Yeah. Your dark appetites. No, 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 no. Easily distracted. ADD. <laughs> uh, that's not going to be enough pens and paper for what I want to do today. So you we'll... should have emailed me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you got any idea how difficult? How many of my workshops have you been to? <laughs> The whole blooming arena. So you say. You me, so you say. So you say. I'll sling your hook. Go get me some more pens. Yeah, exactly. That's the shadow denial for you, right? Now. We'll do some other stuff. The thing about all this hiding is it's the opposite of intimacy. And what I want in my life is connection and intimacy. I don't know if we come from the great big oneness, you know, some people believe that there's a oneness somewhere, a hom one, a big fluffy dolphin in the sky that we all come from. Somewhere in the back of our minds we know we're part of one thing, there's a oneness, we can't quite grasp it because coming to earth into this body, it's so convincing that we're an individual, yes? I mean, we might not really in the great cosmic sense of the world be all individuals, but certainly when you come down to earth, we come as an individual, and that's the point of the Earth theme park, Earth world. 
we come here to have lots of experiences. Because when you're in one, when there's just oneness, just one om, 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 one thing, there can't be any experience. There can't be experience when there's only a oneness, because there's just one thing. There can't, there's just the experience of oneness, maybe, but that's about where it ends. But for there to be a, a bunch of the menu of experiences that we have on planet Earth, there has to be duality, there has to be two. There has to be me as an individual and you lot. Or me and pizza. Or me and a merry-go-round. Or whatever it is I want to experience, there has to be me and that thing. We have to be in duality to have any kind of experience. So when we come to Earth, one of the things for the admission fee for coming here is we all have to sort of take a funny pill that makes us forget the oneness and really believe we're an individual. I believe I'm a Jamie and you're a you and you're a you. We all have to come here and really be convinced we're an individual so that we can have all these experiences. And it's fantastic. The menu of stuff that you can have on this planet, incredible. But what comes with coming here and agreeing to be an individual for this many years also is loneliness, doubt, alienation, competitiveness, worry, disconnect. And that's a pretty high price to pay. So any time that we have an experience which melts that lie, that makes us remember we're not just an individual, we have a really visceral, juicy experience of connection with someone or something. Oh God, it's such an amazing experience. We hand over all our money. When our favorite band play the opening chords of the song that we all love and all of us together roar in appreciation together, we feel that joining, we feel all of us together. It feels so good, hand it all over, 100 quid, 20 quid a ticket, fuck it, I don't care. I feel connected, brilliant. Or in sports, I don't think there's a lot of sports fans here today, but people who do like sports, when they're watching the thing and the team score a goal or whatever happens, they all roar together and it just all, there's that feeling of unity, that feeling of connection. Again, the amount of money we give all the sports people, it gives us that thing of connection. Or when, when you meet that guy that really gets you, he really gets me. Ah, oh, I feel that connection, he really, really gets me. Cosmo, 17 ways to make him stay. <laughs> We hunger after things that give us connection and give us intimacy. It is the riches of life, that feeling of connection, whether it be with a lover, whether it be with friends, whether it be with the whole groups of people enjoying music or sports or whatever. The things that give us connection are the juice. That's why we all come to the festivals in the summer. We spend 10 months of the year being totally alienated and obsessed with our own worries and anxieties and competing and controlling and fighting with people that drift us out of our comfort zone. And then we come and go, oh, togetherness at the festivals. I'm interested in trying to promote a culture where we don't need to wait to come to the festivals to commit to that kind of connection, to commit to silly hats and flatulence being funny. And that's what the Transforming Workshops, uh, Transforming Shadows Workshops are about. It's about exploring how we've each violently edited ourselves down to a unique, wounded, funny origami shape. Each of us a different shape. And anything that drifts us or pulls us or triggers us towards the edge of that comfort zone shape, we fight that person, we manipulate that person, we'll control and condemn and blame and push that person away because we're just so into the comfort zone of this little shape. You think of the last person that annoyed you, the last person before me. They might have been inviting you towards the edge of that comfort zone. But we will push those people away because the feeling of suffocation when anyone threatens that comfort zone is so horrific. We will do anything but not feel it. I want to promote a culture where we start becoming a bit more interested in feeling and becoming fascinated with the triggers that go off in our chests and in our solar plexus when someone pisses us off. Because we all carry this massive accumulation of emotional gunk in our chest and in our throat and in our, all the uncried tears, all the unraged annoyances, everything that treated us badly, everything that wasn't expressed. So when someone annoys us, we don't just feel the, this, the proportionate annoyance that they just gave us. We feel this explosion of everyone that annoyed us that way back to when we were kids. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So unbelievably overreactive we are. And incredibly, we condemn and we'll fight that person. And how could you? I'm going to write an email. 
<laughs> Fuck you, send. <laughs> Hands out all the overreactive bridge burning divas in the tent. <laughs> Feels good. Feels good to be among my people. <laughs> We are so in rejection of our explosive volcanic feelings that go off in us when someone upsets us. We're in total rejection of it. We will do anything to not feel it. Fight that person, condemn that person, manipulate that person, argue that person. I want to create a culture, and this is what the Taoists do, and also some of the Tibetan Buddhists, to actually, instead of constantly fighting this battle externally with everyone and everything that triggers us and makes us feel like, Ugh, no, jealous or disrespected. Instead of constantly fighting these external battles to never have to feel that and create a life and only surround ourselves with people that never make us feel that, to change that whole way of being as a total game changer, to actually start going, no, I'm going to become fascinated with these eruptions that go off in me. And when one of those things goes off, I'm actually going to feel into it, feel where is it in my body. Start breathing gently into it. Start dissolving it like the Taoists do. They say ice to water, water to steam, and they start actually paying attention to it. Instead of being totally in rejection of what goes off in us, to start turning our attention towards it and breathing gently into it. But it takes a commitment to do that, like Gabriel Ross says, it takes immense discipline to be a free spirit. If you don't do that, you're living a life of reactive slavery to the last twat that crossed your path. But if you do decide to become fascinated instead of in total rejection of all the stuff that's going on inside you, that's the ticket to freedom. Because you become powerful. When something comes along and triggers you, when you start turning your fascination and your curiosity onto dissolving it and feeling it and daring to be with it instead of fighting it and being in rejection of it, suddenly it morphs, suddenly it changes. It changes from pain to horniness or creativity or even laughter sometimes and you feel powerful and you reclaim a part of yourself that's been locked up. Every single time someone fucks you off and you decide to turn your attention into dissolving and feeling and being with what just erupted in your chest or throat or solar plexus, every single time that that goes off and you decide instead of going into an external battle to turn your fascination and curiosity into that feeling and breathe gently into it, you become powerful. You don't become reactive and the slave and the puppet to everything that crosses your path anymore. You suddenly become somebody who is reclaiming part of themselves every single time something difficult happens. It is a total lifestyle change and it, my life has gone from black and white to colour since I started doing that. I might say it 19 times during this workshop because I really, if you take nothing else from the nonsense we're going to get up to for the next two hours, I want you to really reflect on this one thing. Every time something erupts in my chest when I open the bank statement, when so-and-so, like the one thing we love, we, we're so overreactive. In our culture, we're not living where bombs are dropping or we've got to walk eight hours for clean water, but we will ruin a whole day or even a whole relationship over the tone of voice you just spoke to me in. <laughs> yes? Hallelujah, anybody? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Becoming fascinated by the suffocating or volcanic stuff that keep, volcanic stuff that keeps erupting in us is freedom. And what happens every single time we love ourselves enough to feel that, every single time I fight a battle instead of feeling that, I'm abandoning myself. I'm saying my feelings aren't okay, what going on? Okay, I'm going to fight you to not feel it. But every single time I turn my attention inside, I'm loving myself. People go, well, what is self-love? How do you love yourself? Oh, I made myself a chamomile tea. Is that enough? Self-love means truly being with ourselves in those moments where the volcano goes off or the suffocation goes off instead of fighting the twat that did it. Even if they're wrong, especially if they're wrong, it doesn't matter if they're wrong. We'll deal with them tomorrow once we've come back to our center and we're not in a triggered, overreactive space. But to come to this fascination, and start breathing gently into the dissolving what is going off in us. It makes us powerful. And it starts releasing this incredible amount of creative energy. And that's what Transforming Shadows is really about. It's about stopping hiding from ourselves and actually having the intimacy with ourselves and other people to be with what actually is. Not having this front of, no, no, I'm fine. 
I just can't be bothered with him, that's all. No, you're hurt. It's not that you can't be bothered. Any time you hear someone in a frosted book, oh, I can't be bothered. What does that even mean, I can't be bothered? It means it hurts. Jamie, to feel, to feel like that, is it, I, I'm sorry for just speaking out. Mm-hmm. You don't have to say sorry. Doesn't it require time and space to something feel you in an energy field? And when you've got kids and they're on you, it can be harder to find space sometimes than others, absolutely, especially with kids. But when you're really honest with kids, we've got this kind of complicit agreement that we must never let the kids see that we're upset. We must never let the kids see that we're off balance or that we're having a tragic day. Actually, kids need to be part of that part of life because when you show them that you're having a tragic day and you really need time out, they're going to be all right in their lives to feel all right asking for time out when they need it. But if we keep modeling to them, no, no, I'm fine, kids just keep calling it, no, 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 I'm fine, I'll put up with it. The kids think that they've got to live a life where they're fine and they're just putting up with it. And they're never going to be modeled with the idea that they can take space. Even with kids, you can find space. You know, you can say, kids, I'm now going upstairs, I don't want you to disturb me for five. Even five minutes of presence can make such a huge, huge difference. Put on Finding Nemo again. <laughs> Can you give to kids too much pasta? That's another question. <laughs> so I really want to promote and, and, and be part of creating this culture where one, we're becoming fascinated what, by what's corrupting us, the fact that the things, because this incredible self mending, self cleaning body that we've got, it knows. It knows that we're carrying this huge constipated load of shit, of emotional dump down our chest. It knows, and it wants to clean it out. It's hardwired to be cleaning and mending itself. So knowing that, it's a genius body-mind system. It knows that it's carrying a huge amount of constipated emotional gunk and overreactive stuff. So of course it keeps creating situations where that stuff gets activated. So that if we're skillful, we can breathe into it and dissolve it. It's a gift. When someone comes along and upsets you and activates and makes all that stuff reactive, it's your body-mind genius system creating something so that you can do a little astral shit. You need to be offloading some of it daily, so if you don't meet a twat every day, you better find one. All these difficult, challenging people that you meet, they are walking laxatives. That's what they are. Challenging people and situations are walking laxatives. Come specially so that you've got an opportunity to have a little astral poo and get rid of another thimbleful of that shit you carry every day. And if you get rid of a thimbleful every day in a year, you're as cool and as enlightened as me. I swear, making this part of your life, getting rid of a thimble full of that overreactive shit, starting to treat these difficult people and situations as opportunities to do a little bit of breathing into it and dissolving it, changes your life from black and white to color. And until you do that, you are an overreactive puppet. You are the bitch to the last thing that happened all day. That's why people say, same shit, how's how's your life? Oh, same shit. It's the same shit, different clothes, because we're in a loop of reacting to it, reacting to it, reacting to it, pushing it away, reacting to it, pushing it away. So of course it needs to keep coming back again and again and again, the same thing. I'm not saying it's easy to welcome that twat every time, especially when they're wrong. But if you can take a little space and dare to take your fascination inside and start dissolving it, life becomes 3D. So we're going to do a few little games and frolics and stuff today which expand what I would call the, the, the skill that you need to have to do this. The skill that you need to have to do what I'm describing and to actually welcome all this stuff that's coming along to help you dissolve. Life is so genius, it's sending you just the right amount of drip feeded stuff to dissolve just the right amount every day. If you d- dare to be that pro you know pro It's the opposite of paranoia. A sneaking suspicion that that twat that crossed my path is actually doing something good for me. Is that an actual word? Yeah. Pronoia? Yeah. Let's, let's make it one. <laughs> there's one muscle, there's one skill that we need to cultivate in order to live a life like this, in order to actually dare to turn our attention and start dissolving it, in order to look at life change the framing 
The framing we were given, the, the camera lens that we all look through, that we were given by our parents is Victim 101. It happened to me, it's not fair, that guy's an asshole. And we're just so right that that guy, did it hurt, therefore that person caused it. There's a big difference between someone causing you pain and someone triggering your pain. When someone, I believe, when someone comes along and makes you upset, that upset was already in you. You were a walking time bomb waiting for someone to come and trigger that upset. They didn't come and put it in you. The proof of that is if somebody came in here now and started being full-on racist and then just crazy, foaming, racist UKIP person came in here now, I might have a meltdown and go, oh my god, he's a racist! And you might sit there and go, well, that guy's a racist, but it's not emotionally affecting me. I just don't want to hang out with him. So the same stimulus came in, the same racist came in, I'm freaking out having an emotional meltdown, you're not. What does that tell us? The same thing came in, he's not freaking out, I am. Why? Because that is in me. It triggered what was in me, it didn't trigger him. It proves that when it, whatever your reactions to things are, are your business. Because different people react in different ways. Because of how they are, not because of what came in. How you react is unique to you, so only you and start turning your attention to that and start dissolving it. The Tibetan Buddhists call it tonglen. The Taoists call it outer dissolving. And I love the Tibetan Buddhists when they do their dissolving and they breathe into it at the end of it, they go, may all beings have a bit more ease from this drama. Because when you're feeling jealous, it's not even just your jealousy, you're just feeling the jealousy. There is a whole load of jealousy. The one muscle we need to cultivate in order to see that stuff coming, in order to, to change the lens from victim 101 to maybe this is a gift 102, is emptiness and listening. To cultivate, to spend a little time every day or a couple of times a week, cultivating our ability to pause and leave space is the key to it all. That's the key to the door of freedom, is learning when to pause not rush in and act and fight. Learning how to pause. The ancient Chinese, the Taoists, they have a whole wing of knowledge called Wu Wei. Wu Wei, W-E and then a new word, W-E-I. It means active non-doing. How cool is that? Deliberately not doing anything. Wu Wei, leaving space. The more we leave space, suddenly all this data and information is available. I've made my living in my life writing songs for people and for myself. When I write a song, I twiddle around on the guitar and I'm kind of listening for a melody. I'm, going, ah, 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 ah. I'm listening for a song. When I hear a melody, I go, oh, no, no, and I write it down, but it was a listening experience. Creativity is a receptive, emptying, listening experience. You don't think up a song like putting bricks on top of each other. You empty and you listen for a song. When you're writing, it's like you're in free flow, it's just coming into your ears and you're transcribing when you're doing your best writing. When you're with your best friend and they're heartbroken and they're really hurt and you love them so much you're really giving them full presence, you're really listening to them because you love them, some incredible insight comes out of your mouth, some genius Buddhist thing coming up, oh, fuck that was so deep. I don't, where, I don't know where it comes from sometimes. I'll tell you where it comes from, it comes from the space of listening. Whatever you can think up with your thinky mind is nowhere near as good as what's going to come out of your mouth when you're in an empty listening space. Then the big mind comes out with some really good shit. Hallelujah. You, you just take the money and the credit. And that's why you feel a bit funny when someone comes up and goes, oh, I love your song, I love this, I love what you did. You feel a bit embarrassed because it wasn't really you, it just kind of came out. All the best stuff happens in the listening field, learning how to listen. The best love making is when you're in the listening field, when you're really listening, really tuning into that person. All the best parenting happens when you're in the listening field, when you're really listening and empty yourself and tuning in. You know the best thing to do. You know what everybody needs. You know what you need. How often do we give ourselves that listening, that intimacy with ourselves, and stop in a moment when we're feeling stressed or we're just going along with something we don't want to do, and just stop, put a hand on our heart and go, what do I want right now? We don't do that very often. That's what I want to cultivate and encourage, a moment of space, a moment of pausing, and asking ourselves what we want. So a lot of my workshops cultivate this skill called full body listening. And that is listening beyond just the surface of things. Rudolf Steiner, the famous Cuban acrobat, he has this brilliant meditation 
where he says, when you listen to a dog bark or a baby cry, first of all, just listen to the sound of it, the surface of the dog barking or the baby crying. Then he says, listen behind that sound and see if you can tune into what threw that sound out. What was the impulse that made the dog start barking or the baby crying? What was that sound rooted in? What threw that sound forth? When you start listening behind the words, like Debussy said, music is the space between the notes. When you start listening behind the surface of things, a whole other landscape of data is available. And that's what we cultivate on the workshops, full body listening, and all the stupid games that we play, and all the foolish, inappropriate stuff that we get, on, we get up to on the, on the Transforming Shadows workshops. It is constantly turning in our full body listening, and remembering that this whole body, from your toes to your fingers to the crown of your head, and some people even believe a few inches around it, is the most sophisticated NASA Bahamas Houston Texas satellite dish that can listen on an unbelievable level that is so far beyond the surface level that we are usually listening on. If we drop back into a bit more space, into a bit more emptiness, you suddenly hear everything in a much more 3D, visceral, communicative, wise way. TV in association with getoutofdebtfree.org